Thank you, Fatima. Thank you to the Bond Conference for inviting me. Um, I don't see you as a sector. I think we've gone beyond the times to be working in silos. I see you as people drawn to do something for justice, for peace, for sustainability. And our challenge really is, given the times we live in, how to continue to be able to do that work. For me, it has been work in the service of the earth and communities and people. And this call is more urgent than ever before because sadly, given the development models and the economic models, the planet has been pushed into a deep crisis of her ecological systems. Just look at the fact that we are in the sixth extinction, pushing species to extinction at a thousand times the no normal rate and is going to move up to 10,000 times if we continue business as usual. Um, climate change, if business as usual continues, will be six degrees warmer. But I think that's a smaller part of the problem. The bigger part of the problem is when we negotiated the climate treaty or the biodiversity convention in 1992, and I had a very big role in both, they were talking about climate changing to be life-threatening a century down the road. People are dying today. 1999, 30,000 people died in a cyclone in Orissa. 2013, in my region, I come from the Himalaya, 20,000 people were washed away. And you just have to look across the world. That this is not a future problem, it's a current problem. And sadly, given the irresponsibility of many polluters and many governments who could regulate the polluters, uh, we, as citizens, will have to um, do even more. But the other side of this ecological crisis is the social crisis which takes on many, many, many forms. The crisis of unemployment, the crisis of uprooting and displacement, and when non-sustainable land use combines with climate change, the crisis of refugees. I take you back to 2009, when it was a drought, an extreme drought, that triggered such a collapse of the agrarian economy of Syria, that a million peasants moved to the cities. That was the beginning of the problem. The wars as opportunities for investing in weapon sales is a derivative problem. And I think that's part of the problem, that we are living on derivatives. Remember the 2008 collapse? Derivatives. We are building structures by mining the foundations and thinking now I'll have the second floor and maybe the third floor, but we are preparing for the whole system to collapse. 70% ecosystems have collapsed. Look at the societies you work in this area. If you really started to put a dot on every society under disintegration and collapse, there'd be more areas that are today in conflict and war and instability. The taxi that brought us here was talking about Congo. But the two crises are not separate and I've, you know, the, the UN uh, conference in uh, 1992 was called UNSAID. We used to joke a lot about it. But it was the UN conference on environment and development and the two were supposed to come together then we still divide, we still separate. In my understanding, the social crisis and the ecological crisis are one crisis because we are interconnected, we are part of nature, but more than that, every time we harm nature, we harm society. And the measures that have been created, I'm trained as a physicist and one thing I can deal with is numbers. And I can tell you every number that rules our minds and our lives today is a fraudulent number. Let me give you just two examples. The first example is productivity. 
Now, a scientific definition of productivity should be output per unit input, where you take all the outputs you create and all the inputs you put in. What is our manipulated productivity? You only count commodities, not the benefits to society, not the well-being, and the only input you count is human beings, not the resources, not the fossil fuels. This distorted definition has come from the fossil fuel age, where it was assumed that we've got to use more fossil fuels and displace more people. And sadly, the very definition of a productive enterprise is the less people there. When it comes to food, that definition becomes the root of hunger and malnutrition. Because you define a productive system as one which produces more commodities with less people and more fossil fuels. So on the one hand, you get climate change. I've done a book called Soil and Not Oil before Copenhagen. 40 to 50% of greenhouse gases come from industrial farming and globalized distribution of food. That globalized distribution of food is not creating food, not producing food. 90% of the corn and soya is going for animal feed and biofuel. So we shouldn't be surprised that a billion people are denied food. But it's not just a billion who are denied food, two billion are denied healthy food. And that includes in the north. Because we are not looking at producing food. We're looking at producing commodities. We're not looking at how much inputs we made in resource terms, water terms, fossil fuels. Terms. 10 units of energy to produce one unit of food. No sector could survive with that system. The only reason it does is we externalize. Our calculations show for India $1.2 trillion of externalities every year. We're destroying as much of the environment and society as we have a GDP. Our work has also shown that when you look at food and you look at nutrition and you measure that and do a true productivity, we can food feed to India's by taking care of biodiversity, which also then takes care of climate change because inorganic farming is the only ecological system that takes the excess greenhouse gases from the atmosphere and puts them into the soil. This is now scientifically established. And the Secretary of State was talking about you know, <coughs> the sustainable development goals uh, being missed by a century and two centuries. Our work is showing that if the whole world went organic, in 10 years, we could reverse climate change. If we all went organic, we could get rid of malnutrition tomorrow. Because there's a British Journal article that's showing 60% loss in the nutrition in our food because of chemical farming. Because nutrition begins in the soil. This brilliant, um, you know, the person who promoted organic farming by learning from Indian peasants, Sir Agric uh, Albert Howard, wrote a book called The Agriculture Testament, was sent to India in 1905 to improve us. And that's part of the problem, that we are always being improved. But he was humble enough to recognize that he had more to teach England. And the Soil Association, through Eve Balfour, was, bought, you know, uh, was born out of that. And he said so clearly that the Indian peasant is my professor. So we measure biodiversity, we measure nutrition, we measure soil health. And he said, health is a continuum from the soil to the plants to the humans. It's one continuum, something we've forgotten. Our farmers, their incomes are declining, small farms are disappearing in England, in Europe, in India. I won't go into the details of how that works, but I can tell you that ecological agriculture has increased incomes in India tenfold. And in certain really high value crops, a hundredfold. So much of what we grew, 10,000 species we used to eat, 
We've been reduced to 12, and the global trade is now four GMO. Tr four. That doesn't make for health. We are only 10% human cells. We are 90% our gut microbiome. And I think this is an amazing teacher for our times. Because even to deal with the refugee crisis, all we have to look at, what are we? What's the self that's getting insecure? Well, the self is not you in a little box. The self is a trillion microbes that are your companions. The big shift we need to make is giving up a second false indicator. During the wars, it was obviously necessary to mobilize resources for fighter jets and bigger armies. And for that, the GDP was created. It measures only that which is sold. The definition in the national accounts is if you produce what you consume, you don't produce. That puts all of nature's work to zero, all of women's work to zero, all of peasant work to zero, and all of self-provisioning economies to zero. An emergency measure became a permanent measure, and the GDP has become the most powerful number that rules our lives. But the more GDP grows, the more poverty grows. The more GDP grows, the worse our rivers become. The worse our air becomes. The more the sickness becomes. And if you start to add these externalities, it's a negative growth. China did the study in minus 9% growth for itself. The dual crisis of the planet and our societies has really pushed us to the brink. Scientists, Stephen Hawking, businessmen like Ian, uh, uh, Ellen, Ellen, the electric car guy, uh, <laughs> and now the SpaceX one. They're all talking about extinction being inevitable, and therefore we have to escape from this planet. Now, I think that's a very big part of the problem, and it is, of course, typically patriarchal, that you can create a problem and run away, and someone else will clean the mess, and someone else will clean the mess. I think, first of all, uh, uh, extinction is not inevitable. Escape is not responsible. Staying home and taking care of the earth, taking care of our particular homes, is the work we have to do. For this, we've got to redefine much of what is at the root of causing harm. And every SDG, if you take care of the earth and provisioning for the real needs of people, each of them can be met. And they can be met in 10 years to create a better life. That's why I work with the government of Bhutan. They said, we won't measure GDP. We'll measure mere well-being and happiness. They actually measure well-being and happiness. Development there is protecting the forest. Development there is having respect for your culture. That's also the reason over the last 30 years, I've created the movement, Navdanya, for seed sovereignty, for food sovereignty, which is where, from hundreds of thousands of farmers, the evidence is coming that we can address malnutrition while taking care of the soil and the climate and creating more work and more meaningful work. The same tiny alienated billionaires are talking about 99% humanity being disposable because we're going to have artificial intelligence and robotics. You can't live in a world with 99% disposable people. And no one is and should be disposable because everyone has a contribution to make, a unique contribution. That's why I think of the biodiversity paradigm where every species has, has a place, every person has a place. In a forest, that little herb is not counted as useless. And this year we're going to be doing a big biodiversity congress building ecological civilization. For those of you who want to find out more, go to the website of Navdanya, uh, and as well as the website of Seed Freedom. The Secretary of State addressed two issues, uh, three issues, education, malnutrition, poverty. They're all achievable. 
we will, of course, have to change what we recognize as learning. I've created an Earth University because the learning we need is how do we live at peace with the Earth and each other. Those are different skills. Malnutrition, better farming. Even in this country, you need more people on the land and the young people want to be on the land. The economies around nourishing people can take care of everyone, but this applies even more to the South where the wrong model of development is uprooting people and displacing people, and that's the root of the refugee crisis. Yes, we can take care of refugees in refugee camps, but the two deep solutions are ensure that our models don't displace them. Second, that the insecurities created through non-sustainability don't translate into inequalities of such a kind that in insecurity breeds fear and hate and a model of an economy that destroys people's lives, creates deep divisions between the 1% and 99%, ends up creating a politics in which the capital is only hate and only fear. In these precarious times, each one of us counts. Let's play our role. Thank you. Thank you.